right so we'll start the lecture now so in the previous lecture we had just touched upon the navier stokes equation so we discussed that uh, now we are fully equipped to be able to start solving the navier stokes equation which was uh, sort of the main aim of this course given the course is called computational fluid dynamics so the equation of fluid dynamics uh, in uh, two dimensions and uh, we'll be writing this for incompressible Uh, flows as we discussed so first we have the continuity equation so let's write it in two dimensions so the velocity field uh, will be given as components u and v right so we can write the continuity equation as del u by del x plus del v by del y equal to 0 or we can simply write it in the coordinate free notation as divergence of the velocity field v is equal to 0 so this is the continuity equation next uh, we have the momentum equation so let's write the x momentum equation so yesterday i did not write the body force because of uh, gravity so we can also write this and this is absorbed in the source term so let's write it this time or let's get rid of it for now okay we'll worry about it later because for example in applications where you have air flowing um, you will not i mean the uh, body force contribution is negligible so let's uh, it is there but in some cases it can be neglected so let's not worry about that for now right and similarly we have the y momentum equation which is for the transport of y momentum so it will be uh, an equation for v the uh, y component of velocity these are the equations that uh, we want to solve for and uh, the unknowns here are uh, the velocity components u and v and the pressure field p so we have three unknown unknowns here and we have three equations so we can uh, solve it but the problem is that there is no explicit equation for p p just appears in the x and y momentum equations there is no explicit transport equation for p that we could use to solve it so it becomes a bit tricky so what we do is we do uh, some sort of a coordinate transformation rather than solving for uh, u v and p ultimately uh, even if we transform the coordinates we can always get these things back from that transformation rule so what we do is instead of uh, solving for uh, or writing the equations or solving the equations for u v and p we'll uh, solve for 
the coordinates omega and psi omega represents the vorticity here and psi represents the stream function so i'll explain, i'll write uh, what these quantities mean and then we'll do a transformation of coordinates and using the transformation rule you can always find the u v and p fields given that you have solved for omega and psi so first what i'll do is i'll uh, write the expression or in fact uh, let's uh, derive the expression for omega from intuition so vorticity as we know is uh, represents rotation you have that field and you also have uh, you might remember it's given as the curl of velocity field vector v but uh, let's let's see how uh, we can represent rotations so let's say you have a velocity field uh, just uh, flow happening in the x direction uh, which looks like this that's typically what you see in boundary layers where uh, the velocity x velocity becomes zero at the boundary and then as you go up it increases right so what if uh, i had if if i just put an object let's say a very light rod i place it vertically like this in this flow field will it rotate yes yes clockwise or anti clockwise 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 because the top uh, part will have a velocity in the x direction which is larger than the bottom part so it will tend to rotate in the clockwise direction so i can say that uh, this velocity gradient in this case the blue uh, velocity field i have written is del u by del y so you can see that the u velocity component increases with y so del u by del y is positive so uh, del u by del y gives a clockwise rotation but given that we always want to write anti clockwise as positive so i can say here minus del u by del y implies a positive or counter clockwise rotation clear similarly uh, any velocity can be written as a sum of uh, its components in uh, x and y directions so let's uh, think of a purely y velocity field so let's say it looks like this now again i put an object like this how will it rotate counterclockwise counter clockwise right so i can uh, then say and this velocity field is uh, del v by del x being positive so a positive del v by del x gives a counter clockwise a positive rotation it's not just rotation it's actually a rate of rotation it means it keeps rotating because you have a velocity field sorry acha uh, no no counter because we have given uh, minus del u by del y right? so uh, what we do is uh, very intuitively we can write omega as del v by del x minus del u by del y you will not forget this anymore this is how you write the expression for omega vorticity of course i mean if you are uh, working in three dimension this is only for two dimensions if you are working in three dimensions you write omega vector as the curl of the velocity field v but if your velocity field is only in two dimensions you end up getting the omega vector as del v by del x minus del u by del y in the <coughs> perpendicular direction coming out of the plane so we'll deal with omega as just a scalar we'll not uh, although vorticity is a vector but in two dimensions it can be handled as a scalar in the sense that we are talking about the z component of vorticity but you get the idea and this is what vorticity is what we talk about this del v by del x minus del u by del y Now let's uh, is that clear so let's come to stream function 
So vorticity can be defined in three dimensions as well for a fully 3D flow field. But stream function on the other hand is only defined for two dimensional flow fields. So that's the reason we started with a 2D flow field and uh, three dimensional flow fields can sometimes be approximated as two dimensional flow fields. In that case, we can use the approach. Right, so stream function, psi. Now, when you're solving for uh, uh, velocities, you have uh, the unknowns as uh, u and v. So, in, in this approach of stream function, we define a function so that we don't have to solve for two different velocity components. The stream function contains information about both velocity components. Now, you may um, argue that, uh, see, the velocity field v has two components one in the I dire uh, uh, x direction and one in the y direction. So how can I define a psi which contains information about both u and v when u and v are independent? But are they really independent? It's a equation. Right, so continuity equation is uh, an equation which sort of links the velocity fields u and v. So if I know u, I can find v using continuity equation, right? So u and v are not independent, u and v are related to each other through the continuity equation. So if I can uh, smartly define, well, uh, I as in like somebody already did that, I think Lagrange did that. So if, if uh, we can define uh, smartly a stream function or a scalar field psi, which can, from which I can uh, derive both the velocity components u and v, then I'll get rid of one equation. So what we do is we define a stream function psi so that it automatically satisfies the continuity equation by definition. And if it does that, then I don't have to solve the continuity equation because when I'm solving for psi, it by definition uh, satisfies the continuity equation. Okay. So we define uh, velocity components u as del psi by del y and v as minus del psi by del x. And you can check if uh, check uh, if continuity is satisfied. So continuity is del u by del x plus del v by del y. So let's substitute for u, which is del psi by <laughs> del y. And this you can see is zero. So this uh, satisfies continuity. So we define. So we'll I'll put three lines here, which denotes definition. So that's how we have defined the stream function. Is that clear? And the stream function has other uh, significance as well that if you have, uh, if, you, if you plot psi equal to constant, you get streamlines. Streamlines are those lines at which the uh, tangential direction shows the velocity. So if you have flow happening uh, in, in a circle, so it's, it's a circular flow field, then uh, your streamlines will actually look like this. And if you were to draw tangential, then your velocity field would look like this. Okay. So this is the significance of streamline as well. So streamlines, if you plot psi to constant lines, you get streamlines. That's the reason it's called a stream function. And if you have two constant stream function values, then uh, psi 1 minus psi 2 will denote the discharge or the rate of flow between these two lines. Because the flow is happening tangential. Right. So anything between that is trapped between it, it cannot go out because the flow is tangential at that boundary. So the amount rate of flow that is happening between two streamlines is given as psi 2 minus psi 1 or psi 1 minus psi 2 given the convention we follow for the direction. Exactly. But that's not important for us. For us what's important is this, these expressions for u and v. 
because now if I solve for the stream function psi, if I get psi as a function of x, y and t, then I can easily find u and v. u is del psi by del y and v is minus del psi by del x. Okay. So let's now uh, do this, uh, now that we have defined stream function and vorticity, let's do a coordinate transformation to go from the uh, continuity equation is sorted because continuity is by default uh, satisfied by the stream function psi. So I don't need to worry about continuity at all. Okay. Now we only have x and y momentum equation. So let's go from x and y momentum equations to the equations for transport of vorticity and stream function. I'll not go uh, through all the steps. I'll just write the steps. But if you uh, um, think about it uh, long enough, you'll easily figure it out. So let's call these equations A and B. So A is the x-momentum equation and B is the y-momentum equation. I'm not uh, giving any name to continuity because that's already sorted now. So let's write here that uh, satisfies continuity by definition. So what we are doing now is called the vorticity stream function formulation. So first we will uh, derive the equation for vorticity. So uh, vorticity if you remember was del V by del X minus del U by del Y. So let's quickly check. So del V by del X minus del u by del y. So equation number b was a transport equation for v and equation number a was a transport equation for u. So what I do is I write del b by del x minus del a by del y. So what that means is I have uh, del by del x of equation number b. Now equation number b was the equation for y momentum. So that was del v by del t plus uh, plus v dot grad uh, small v. So this becomes u del by del x of v plus v del by del y of v, that's the convection term. And then um, what I'll do is I'll move all the terms to the left hand side. So that on the right hand side I have a zero, then I can easily uh, manipulate these. So that minus one by rho times del p by del y comes to the left with a plus sign. And then uh, the diffusion term gets a negative sign because it's on the left hand side now, plus nu times Laplacian of v. Nu is uh, the kinematic viscosity. So I'll write it here. This nu is which is given as the dynamic viscosity mu upon rho. Okay. So this is del b by del x. Then we subtract del by del y. Now remember this is a right, uh, this is a zero on the right hand side. So that will still remain zero. Then we have del u by del t plus u del by del x of u plus v del by del y of u plus one by rho del p by del x this time minus nu times Laplacian of u. On the right hand side we get a zero. So this is uh, what you get if you do del by del x of equation number b minus del by del y of equation number a. Now let's look at the transient term. The transient term is del by del x of del v by del t. 
So what I do is I swap the derivative. The order of derivatives can be changed. So I can do uh, write this as del by del t of del v by del x. So what we get is del by del t. Let's write it here. Del by del t of del v by del x minus del u by del y, which is coming from the second equation. That's the reason we did it. We wanted the equation for vorticity omega. So del v by del x minus del u by del y is omega, right? Is that clear? So I can simply write this as del by del t of omega. So the first terms of each equations <coughs> become uh, becomes uh, del omega by del t. Similarly, if you go through all the terms, the next term will be del by del x u times del by del x of omega plus v times del by del y of omega. And then if you look at the pressure term this time, that cancels. That was the whole idea. I want to get rid of pressure. So look at the pressure term. Uh, it's uh, 1 by rho is fine. It's a constant. Then we have del by del x of del p by del y. And then we have del by del y of del p by del x. And you are subtracting them. So that becomes a 0. So we get rid of the pressure gradient terms. So that's gone. And then we have a minus new times Laplacian of omega and that is equal to zero. <coughs> so now let me write it uh, in the way that we have been writing the common form. So if you recall the common form was del by del t of <coughs> the field omega. Uh, plus u del by del x of omega plus v del by del y of omega and the right hand side we can write the diffusivity or oh, sorry this uh, uh, viscosity or diffusivity whatever you want to call it because that's also viscosity is nothing but diffusion of momentum and then we have the uh, Laplacian of omega or uh, let's expand it so del 2 omega by del x2 plus del 2 omega by del y. So this we will call equation C. Now let us recall the uh, first few lectures. So this was the transient term. This was the convective term. <coughs> convective term we have uh, handled if you look just look at the uh, first part. This we have handled in the 1D wave equation very recently, right? We had u del phi by del x. That's what it is, except that now you have two dimensions. And the right hand side is alpha times del 2 phi by del x2 plus del 2 phi by del y2 and that is what we have dealt in the parabolic equations. So this is the diffusion. That's the beauty that whatever you have learned till now, those ideas can be applied now to solve this vorticity equation. <coughs> Is that clear? Now, uh, this form of the equation is called the non-conservative form of the vorticity equation or in general any equation. So, this uh, is called the non-conservative form. By the way, from now onwards, we will start using the finite volume method. So, we will also introduce the finite volume method to you now because that is more commonly used in fluid mechanics. So, the finite difference method was introduced just to understand because that is much more simpler, but finite volume is much more um, it's, it's, uh, well, accurate for uh, conservative forms of equations or it is also, it can be used for unstructured grids and so on which, is, which becomes uh, more robust. For handling different situations. Okay, so this is a non conservative form. <coughs> but when we use finite volume methods, we would want to work with conservative forms. So that ensures the conservation of the field that we are dealing with. In the sense uh, that does not, we do not lose uh, some uh, quantity just because of numerical issues. So uh, for getting the conservative form, what we do is 
we add something to the left hand side that something will be zero so if you add a zero to the left hand side that's no problem so what i do is on the left hand side we add a quantity which is omega times del u by del x plus del v by del y now del u by del x plus del v by del y is a zero that's the continuity equation so i can add omega times this quantity to the left hand side uh because the uh quantity omega is not conserved okay so let's look at the conservative form then it uh, it will start making more sense how we can say that omega is not conserved yeah so you have to give me more time to explain that okay so uh let's uh, add this term now uh, you had a u del omega by del x and what we are doing is we are adding omega times del u by del x so this can be written as del by del x of u omega So in the finite volume methods, what we'll do is we'll integrate this equation, as we'll see later part of the lecture. So what we'll see is that this quantity, uh, this uh, um, u times omega, will uh, easily come out of that integration integration into. So we'll convert that volume integral to a surface integral. So that is uh, the process will ensure that the quantity, um, this omega, is conserved. We are not losing that information because of some numerical issue in the. equation so that is the reason this equation is called a conservative form okay this only it's numerical uh, <coughs> reasons that uh, we call it conservative otherwise this equation these both equations are the same okay so whenever you are dealing with uh, things which would want to stay conserved like for example mass if you have a mass equation transport of mass equation then it makes sense to use a conservative form Although non-conservative form is also the same equation, but when you deal with it numerically using finite volume methods, you tend to get. So if you track the value of that unknown, let's say phi, which is mass, with time, you will see that phi will remain constant because of the way we define, way we uh, derive the finite volume methods. Right. So this is uh, equation number C B is our equation. Yes. Sir, uh, after adding omega, del u by del x, the term we have added in the hand side. How we can equate with the same value that we have before? Well, you can expand del by del x of u omega. You see, what you get is u times del omega by del x plus omega times del u by del x. So u times del omega by del x comes from here, and what we have added is omega times del u by del x. Similarly, for the second term as well. Okay. so we have added uh, this uh, term omega times del u by del x plus del v by del y to equation number ca so you can see that uh, this is what we get right so this was the equation for vorticity so let's uh, box it it's important we'll be solving it but that's only for vorticity what about stream function Okay, let's say I am able to start with some initial value of vorticity omega. Given that I know the initial values of u and v everywhere, uh, I can transport omega. But I, I, I can transport omega. But the point is, how do I get u and v at different times? I know the u and v initially, but I do not know the u and v at intermediate. That is what I want to solve for. So as you proceed with the next time step, we will not be able to solve for omega because we do not know the u and v values at that time. That is what we want to solve for. so for that we need need the stream function so to get the equation for stream function we'll uh, write the expression for vorticity so let's 
derive the stream function equation. So in this uh, definition for omega, let's substitute the uh, expressions for u and v in terms of stream function. So omega becomes minus Laplacian of <coughs> psi. And this also fits our common form. This is the this is called a Poisson equation. We have solved this equation. I can rearrange the equation because the unknown is uh, always kept on the left hand side. That's the trend and the knowns are kept on the right hand side. Uh, but anyways, uh, if uh, I can write it in any ways, that doesn't matter. So I can write this as Laplacian of psi is equal to minus omega. We have solved this, right? In the heat fin problem. Except that we solved it in one dimension. Okay. So Laplacian of psi equal to zero is what kind of an equation is that? Elliptic, parabolic or hyperbolic? Elliptic. 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 Laplacian of psi equal to 0 is del 2 psi by del x2 plus del 2 psi by del y2 equal to 0. We have solved this in two dimensional heat conduction. If you put omega on the right hand side, and omega is a known value in the sense that we, let's say we have already solved for omega in the first step. We will use that omega here. So the way we solve this equation is, although they, are, they both are coupled, so let us call this equation number d. But the way we have written is, on the left hand side we have unknowns, on the right hand side we have known omega from equation number C, B. So this equation is actually called uh, a Poisson equation. Why would you do that? Right, uh, so come some key things to note. Continuity is automatically satisfied with this omega psi formulation. You don't have to worry about continuity equation. Pressure is eliminated. So we have only two unknowns, omega and psi. So we solve we solve equations uh, C, B and D simultaneously to get omega and psi fields. Because uh, let's look at equation CB. So here we are solving for omega. So at the first time step, I can solve for omega. Right? And then what I can do is I can use that omega to get the value of psi. Right? The right hand side of omega is known, so you can get the values of psi at the same time step because you have solved for omega. And then you can uh, then you can uh, find the values of u and v, and we can uh, use them in the next time step. So we are always, uh, you know, lagging uh, one because although they are coupled, they have to be solved at the same time. But we tend to follow this approach to decouple the equations by using the psi values that we have just obtained to get u and v because u and v will be required for the vorticity equation again for the next time step. 
in these convection terms. You use those u and v values, you get the new omega values. And then you use the new omega values to get the new psi values. And you continue this loop. There was a question. Thank you. Now you may ask that, okay, we can get u and v now at all times. Good. But what about pressure? Sometimes we need pressure as well. We have eliminated pressure, but we would want to find the pressure value. Well, you can. You can easily uh, have, if you really want the pressure uh, as a function of time as well. So what you can do is you can uh, include in that loop an equation for pressure as well. So what you do is you simply take... Uh, To get pressure as well, what you do is you do a del by del x of equation number a and equation number a if you remember was the x momentum equation. So that's uh, the x, x derivative of that equation and then you add a del by del y of the, sorry uh, should be other way around, a and then this should be b. So when you do that, this time the pressure will not vanish. In fact, what you uh, what you get is you get an equation which looks like del 2p by del x2 plus del 2p by del y2. On the right hand side, you have some function of uv and its derivatives, partial derivatives of u and v. And you can find those using, uh, because you have solved for psi for the time step. So you can get the values of u and v and the derivatives as well. Because you, if you know psi, you know u and v. And if you know u and v, you can get also get the derivatives. So once you find the right hand side, so that's an additional equation you have to solve for p in every time step, if you need pressure. If not, then you are fine. So this is called uh, a pressure Poisson equation. So this is used in this stream function vorticity formulation to get the value of pressure field at every time step if that is required using our uh, stream function and vorticity values. In fact, uh, stream function will suffice here. Yes, sir. Uh, we can find pressure by directly putting the values of u and v in the momentum equation. You get the pressure gradient. Yes, sir. Right. That is. Uh, From here we are getting Laplacian. Yeah. I mean, we will discuss it more in, in detail when we solve it because you get del p by del x and del p by del y, then you have to solve for pressure out of those. This is much more convenient. This is they are the same equation. There's nothing uh, different about it. Right. So let's uh, summarize our system. So the vorticity stream function equations. So this point is important that they are coupled. So you cannot solve for omega for all times first and then you can solve for all uh, these or the psi value at the final time step. In each time step, in, in each loop of the time step, uh, you have to solve for omega and psi and keep doing that because uh, your uh, updated psi values will help you update the uh, uh, u and v values which are required for the updated omega values. Any questions? So now what we'll do is we'll uh, talk about the finite volume method because that's a method that we'll introduce today and we'll be using that for the remaining part of this course.
so this is how we have introduced a new method of discretization and also we are moving on from our uh, simple equations that we are dealing with now we are dealing with the complete transport equation right uh, so rather than introducing that uh, separately let's introduce that for the equations that we have to solve for it's much easier okay so for now uh, we have a grid which looks like this now we are used to uh, such grids and we know that uh, these nodal points are where we want to find the solution so in a finite volume approach what you do is you generate a control volume around the nodal point any nodal point so let's say this is uh, but let let me zoom into it it's much easier so i only have a few grid nodes just to convey the idea okay. so let's say this is our uh, point i comma j so what i'll do is i will generate a control volume around the point i comma j uh, in some uh, places you will see that uh, this will be denoted as the point capital p so capital p notation is used for the nodal point around which the control volume is found out so you are trying to find the value of the unknowns at that point capital p and this uh, red control volume has four faces so if you look in three dimensions this is a volume in two dimension a volume becomes an area so we'll still keep calling a volume okay but uh, realistically i mean uh, literally in a three dimensional uh, domain you will have a volume around a given nodal point and then uh, the faces of volume in two dimension will be just lines so we'll have four faces of this control volume in this 2d case the right face is called the east face so we'll denote that using a small e the left face is called a west face so that's using a small w top is a small n north and the bottom is a small s south okay that's convention and then to denote the nodal point to the right that will be denoted as a capital e so capital notation is kept for nodal points and small alphabets are used for boundaries or faces okay. right so now that we have some notation in place uh, let's uh, write the equation so let's start with stream function equation it's much easier to work with Uh, so what we do is in a finite volume approach and this red control volume is uh, has a volume called omega because volume has to have some quantity right so the volume is called is is omega so we denote this control volume by omega rather than writing cv we call it omega okay, uh, that's again a convention so what we do is we Uh, write this equation, and we integrate that over the volume <coughs> omega. That is fine because see uh, the equation is valid at every point. If something is valid at every point, you can also add them at different points. That is also true. The other way may not be true. but uh, if something is valid at every point then it is also valid in an integrated sense over a volume right so in a finite volume approach what we do is we don't satisfy the equation at every point strictly we satisfy them in an average sense over a volume so this this approach results in giving us a value of the unknown in this case let's say psi uh, as an average value over the uh, volume rather than strictly at that point so whatever you denote that uh, psi at i comma j will not be actually the value of psi i comma j it will be the average of psi values in the whole volume 
which will be given to that nodal point which is also fine because your volumes are so small so that's okay so we integrate this over the control volume and now what we'll do is uh, we'll apply the gauss divergence theorem okay or uh, gauss divergence formula so uh, the uh, gauss divergence uh, theorem says that so first we have to write it in this form So the first quantity we have is a volume integral because we're integrating over a volume, and Gauss divergence theorem allows us to convert a volume integral to a surface integral. And that's a very uh, useful thing. So think about it: you have a volume, and you would want to talk about some integral over the volume, but now you are converting it to just an integral over the boundaries. So you only have to work on the move on the boundaries. So you only need to know the field value and the boundary, not in the interior. It's a very useful and powerful uh, theorem so this uh, gets converted to a surface integral so gamma capital gamma represents the surface which encloses the volume so this uh, is called a control surface which is denoted by gamma so this red one is actually the volume so let's go inside as per the theorem uh, divergence of a quantity uh, becomes that quantity dotted because grad of omega divergence you always take of a vector so that vector dot with the normal to the surface times d gamma so you break the surface into small surface elements and for each surface element you take a normal vector out and you take a dot product of basically you take the normal component of the quantity grad psi and the second part uh, stays as it is we don't touch it is that clear now for this particular case uh, it's much easier because our control volume uh, is a rectangle or a square so in this case uh, what i can do is i can write this integral which is an integral over the area as a sum of four things because i have four straight boundaries so i can simply i i can uh, for this particular case i can write this as a summation over four faces east west north and south so this becomes uh, let's uh, well uh, grad of psi over the face f dotted with i am absorbing the n hat into the d gamma because uh, typically you do that you the area is a vector right so you can absorb the n hat into d gamma so we call it d gamma vector for the face f and we'll do a summation over f so it's only the first uh, part second part is uh, it's, it's quite trivial so we'll uh, we'll let's let's talk about the first part only for now so uh, after expansion what does it become so let's see the east face the right face so on the right face uh, we have grad psi on the east face dotted with d gamma now d gamma has a direction on the normal has a direction which is to the right okay so for the east face uh, my normal is simply i hat so d gamma f becomes i hat Times now, what is the area of the right face? Delta y. In in one dimension, it's just a line. The so length of the line is delta y. So i times delta y is your d gamma f. And uh, grad psi is simply del psi by del x i hat plus del psi by del y j hat. Clear? 
and if I do a dot of del psi by del i uh, del x i hat and del uh, plus del psi by sorry del psi by del y j hat with an i hat I only get the x component of that so this uh, simplifies to del psi by del x on the east boundary we have to specify where you will calculate the gradient times delta y. So this is the contribution to the sum from the east phase. Similarly, and now I'll do things quickly. On the west phase, it's del psi by del x on the west phase times delta y. This is a negative sign because the area is outwards always. Then uh, for the north phase, we get a del psi by del y on the north phase times delta x. And for the south, we get a negative sign. Sorry, yeah, delta x. Clear? Can you repeat the part how gradient becomes the del psi by del x? Well, there's a dot product here, right? So let's uh, pick a different. Let's pick the north face. So you had uh, this, where you had the north face, and this was the point P. So for the north face, if you are doing uh, what you had was grad of psi. So grad of psi is del psi by del x i hat plus del psi by del y j hat. And this is all on the face which is north face. Dotted with the area element. Now the area of this face is simply delta x times the outward normal which is j hat. Expand this you will get. So this is uh, the first part and the second part is omega times, uh, well there is a small and there is a capital omega. So uh, vorticity times d omega integrated over the control volume. Just a second. Uh, so in the second part what we will do is since we are integrating the vorticity value. So what we will say is that this simply becomes omega at capital P times the, so I can, I can, what I'll do is I'll define uh, omega as an average value over the whole volume. It's a volume average. So I can simply write this as omega p times delta x times delta y. This is how I'm defining my omega capital P. You integrate a quantity and you write it as an average value, which is the integral of that times the volume delta x delta y. Okay. Yes, there was a question. Will it be efficient in 3D volume? Will it be efficient for 3D element? What do you mean by efficient? Means we are taking derivatives or the. It works very well for 3D. Yes. So this is the finite volume formulation. In the next lecture, what we'll do is we will go from here to discretization because we still haven't discretized. Discretized equation is always equation in terms of nodal values. So we have to convert this equation to an equation which has omega, uh, sorry, psi, ij, i plus 1j, i minus 1j, ij plus 1, ij minus 1 and so on. Then you can write a linear system or a matrix uh, equation. So we still haven't got there, but we are almost there. So what we have done till now is called a finite volume formulation of an equation. Is the idea clear? That's pretty much the idea of finite volume. You integrate the equation over a control volume and then you apply a Gauss divergence theorem to convert volume integrals to surface integrals and then you write things in terms of various surfaces and you have to convert that gradients that you get in the surfaces so now we have to write the gradients of psi. Remember psi is the unknown. Omega is the known. So omega we are not worried about. So we write the gradients of psi on the different faces in terms of the nodal values of psi. And then we are done. So then we will uh, just write the matrix system after that. Okay. So we will stop here now and then I will see you.